Uh, okay. Um, hmm. Well, I am going to have to start and read the text to you for those of you who don't have it in front of you. Uh, first, let me just welcome everybody, say how nice it is to see everybody again. Um, let me also um, let Hi Seema, nice to have Hi. you joining us. Um, I wouldn't miss it, Rabbi. So, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, the uh, the schedule of the class is not from 10.30 to noon as advertised. It's from 10.30 to 11.30. So it's the usual hour and it would give people time to go to other things at noon. I know that um, uh, Estelle goes to something at noon and anyway, so if <clears throat> anybody's in touch with her that I'll try to get word to her that, that she can come and still have time. Um, okay, so until I have David here, I'm going to just go to my screen. And I am um, not 100% sure where we ended. I'm sure somebody here probably knows, right? We're talking about Esau, as I recall, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I know we're somewhere in that vicinity. Yeah, actually, in that vicinity. Actually, where I thought we would start is chapter 33. Book. You want to see, you want to see uh, who does have a homage in front of them? We don't have the Bible. Um, Aren't we all? We do somewhere. Chapter 33, page chapter 2, 33. page 203. We went beyond Jacob wrestling with the angel. Yes, so chapter 33 is where Asa and Yaakov Me. reunite. Me. Right. 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 So, Vayisa Yaakov, Enav, Vayar, Vahine, Asa, Ba. The Imo Arba Meot Ish, the Yachat et a Yeladim Alea, the Al Rachel, the Al Ste Ashbachot. So Jacob looked up and he saw Esau coming, accompanied by 400 men. Excuse me, could everybody please mute because there's some background noise coming through? Yeah, and because I'm not the host, I don't have the capacity to mute everybody or not. So this is really a, a bit of a disadvantage. Okay, so uh, Jacob saw Esau coming accompanied by 400 men. He divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maids. Um, Viet Leah, Viet Deha, Acheronim, Viet Rachel, Viet Yosef, Acheronim, putting the maids and their children first, Leah and her children next, Great Rachel and Joseph last. And he went ahead and bowed low to the ground seven times until he was near his brother. Okay, so <clears throat> seemingly a very straightforward narrative description of this encounter. Um, what, what would you say are the salient points thus far uh, that are of interest to us? Yeah, yeah. Oops. Would, some, would someone give the page? I'm... Two, 203. Sorry. It seems to me uh, the, what first comes to my mind is Jacob is clearly showing his favoritism in his family and who he's putting in the front line. One assumes if there's an attack, the people in the front get attacked first. And so it's the handmaidens and their children are first and then Leah and her children and his favorite, Rachel and Joseph. Right. Rear and, and they would be the safest. Right. 
So, um, <clears throat> so yeah. So the first one of the things we noticed is that Jacob arranges the the the, um, the, the, the troops, as it were, with the favorite children and wives to the rear. Okay, where is he? Says he's out front. Um, okay, so he's out front. He's before everybody. Um, so he's not doesn't appear to be using his children or his wives as protection, right? They're not they're not human shields. This is <clears throat> Robin. I was going to say he must not feel vulnerable, and therefore. They are not vulnerable because if he is at the front, he would be uh, using the logic that we just discussed. He would be the most vulnerable to attack. Yeah, so he feels he feels confident and secure. Okay, Susan, unmute. Combination of confidence and fear. Um, as the military leader, which is what we sort of get a sense, he knows he has to be out front uh, to inspire confidence uh, among his people and also to show um, his brother that he is not afraid of him. Uh, on the other hand, he clearly has fear because of how he arranged uh, his entourage. So I just see it as a combo. Okay. It could simply be a matter of the social status of his entourage. What, do you what, mean is, by that? what is the significance of his bowing seven times to his brother? Is there any significance to the number seven there? Well, certainly seven. <clears throat> seven is always a magic number in the Torah, right? Um, Day of, yeah. Days of the week. It's the days of the week, the days of creation, um, but Sheva bro bro Brucha for Sheva Brucha, right? It's 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 wow. it's 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 a, a an all around special number. It shows how special he he wants Esau to feel that he feels that Esau is special, right? I mean, he's bowing to him seven times. He is submitting to him in a sense. He does not have any troops. I mean, one assumes that Jacob has more people with him than his family. So he doesn't come with his armed men, which is how Esau comes, right? He comes just as himself and his family, right? He's not a threat. And he wants to make it clear to Esau he is not a threat, which is, I think, uh, very much in what Susan said, um, an indication of both fear and confidence, and maybe a little bit more fear than confidence in my view, right? I mean, he, he is not at all certain how Esau is going to greet him. The last time, the last time he saw Esau, Esau was out to kill him. So he has every reason to be afraid and more afraid, I think, than confident, okay? Um, and then we get this very famous moment in which Esau runs to him, right, uh, and greets him, embraces him, falls on his neck, and he kissed him, and together they wept. Right? You see that here? No. So, <clears throat> um, it would appear <clears throat> that Isa and Yaakov are reconciled, right? That Isa is no longer um, hunting his brother, but is happy to see him, and they are friends, and everybody's going to live happily ever after, right? Looking for something about Isa. But if you look at the text in the Hebrew. <laughs> You will notice that oh, above the word Vaishakehu, and he kissed him, 
Um, there are a series of six dots. Uh, yeah. I wish I could show that to you, but I can only uh, oh, hope that you can see that in your text. It should be in any text of the Torah that you're using. Right. Now, these dots obviously were not um, put into the Torah by Moshe. Um, they are uh, mm -hmm. relatively late to the party, as it were. Um, they are put in most likely by the Masoretes, that is, those that group of scholars whose um, um, whose life work was maintaining and establishing the accurate text of the Torah that became for the Jewish people authoritative. Right, so. Um, the Torah that we use is called the Masoretic uh, text. Right? It was the result of a group of scholars, a family of scholars that spent generations really and, and devoted their lives to, um, to fixing the, um, the authoritative text of the Torah as we know it. And in a number of places in the text, we have these six dots over a word. Um, and there's no clear explanation in, the, in, in any of the material that we have available to us as to what the purpose of these dots were, except by taking all of them together, uh, we can minimally deduce that the Masoretes thought something was important in this particular verse something so important that they didn't want to take the chance that the reader would miss it. So that opens the question, what's so important about this verse that the Masoretes didn't want to take a chance that we wouldn't notice? Now, I think we could possibly answer that question sort of retroactively when we go through the rest of this chapter, this vignette, right? So let's come back to it and let's um, keep in mind that the word and they kissed is um, uh, marked out as being something that we should be thinking about, right? Yes, Esther. You have to unmute. I, I've un unmuted. It does bring um, to mind because it's highlighted in this way uh, the 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 uh, Christian Bible with the kiss of Judas, um, which mm -hmm. might be a, a take on this and the idea that a kiss could be an act of hypocrisy as well as uh, affection. Okay. Good. Yeah. I mean. So if we, for those of us who know the rest of the story, um, there doesn't seem to be much love lost between Jacob and Esau. Uh, and the rabbi, or, or the Masoretes at least, reflecting rabbinic tradition, in which Esau is, as you probably know, considered to be one of the arch villains of the story, um, the, the highlighting of this kiss would suggest uh, that, in fact, um, J Jacob, uh, um, Esau is being, at the very least, um, insincere. That this is not a real moment of reconciliation. Um, it is, um, you know, well, in, in maybe not quite as dramatic as a kiss of death, but certainly um, not a symbol of, of, of reconciliation as it looks on the page, right? Um, so that raises another question, which we'll, again, we can come back to and we can think about when we finish this, the chapter, which is, um, if we try to read the story 
on the on the on the on the surface level, do we truly get any sense that Esau was a villain? Uh, and if we don't, or if, well, if we don't, then why and do, do, does rabbinic Judaism transform Esau into the vill villain that they do? Right. Well, e even if we look at the Hertz at the Hertz notes below, um, number four on page two zero three, um, the comment is Esau's undoubtedly sincere kiss which is leading us in a direction to believe that this is a true reconciliation. Well, I don't have the hurts in front of me, so oh, I'll- I'm sorry. Take, no, that's okay. Could, could you read it again? Um, the, the comment below says, Esau's undoubtedly sincere kiss, he seems genu genuinely moved by Esau's extravagant gesture signals the conclusion of the chain of events precipitated ja by Jacob's extravagant gesture. By Jacob's extravagant gesture signals the conclusion of the chain of events precipitated by that other kiss, Jacob's deceitful kiss, recounted in 2727. I don't understand how it could be. Thank you. David, welcome. Can you make me host? <laughs> He did already. He did. Yeah, yes, I did. Thank He's you. To be host. Thank sorry, you. sorry to be late. To Not a problem. Him. Okay. There we go. Okay. And um, so now. So I don't know if we're on the right page or not because she, she had a different book when she's mm. told you the page. Now I can mute everybody. Which is a great power. Um, okay, Terry, you have a comment. I had my hand up from before, and someone else made the same. Okay. I, so I just I just I, lowered I, your hand. Yeah, because I, I how do I do that? Can can have me lower your own hand if you once you've raised it. I don't know, and I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. Okay, so um, okay, so now we can look at the text. Um, let's just let me go back. That's an interesting comment in the Hertz. I'm glad you brought that to me. What verse is it? Is that kiss in chapter twenty-seven? Twenty-seven, verse twenty-seven. Twenty-seven, twenty-seven. So, aha. Uh -huh. Then his father Isaac said to him, "Come close and kiss me, my son." <laughs> and he went up and kissed him, and he smelled his clothes, and he blessed him, and he said, "Ah, uh, the smell of my son is like the smell of the fields that the Lord has blessed." So, <clears throat> so there was a kiss. In that. Uh, deceptive meal that Jacob prepared for Yitzchak. And so it was Jacob's kiss that was insincere. Right? Um, and Hertz's comment is suggesting that Jacob's kiss here um, in chapter 33 is indeed sincere. But is he actually saying that Esau's kiss is sincere? And Esau's you, kiss is sincere. You think he's saying that? That's what it says. Esau's undoubtedly sincere kiss, he seems genuinely moved by Jacob's extravagant gesture, signals the conclusion of the chain of events precipitated by that other kiss Jacob's deceitful kiss was uh, recounted in 2727, which played a crucial role in the original blessing. Okay, interesting. So this kiss is a 
um, is a bookend, right? So this really ends the whole story according to that comment in Hertz. Um, I, I have to say that's a it's a very unusual. I, I mean, I'm sure that Hertz is basing himself on good sources, but it's not the usual reading of the story. Terry. Yeah, I I I don't know that they have the Hertz. I have the old uh, Hertz Kumash, and the comment is is a little different from the one that they just read because the first part of it uh, of the comment about kissed him reflects what you said, that um, that the rabbi said that um, it's because it's marked with all the dots, they doubted whether the kiss of Esau was genuine or not, and then continued with what you had said. But then it continues that other rabbis have said that that kiss seemed to be the answer to Jacob's prayer, the rabbis say. God had turned, so it was God who did it, who turned Esau's hate to love. Be that as it may, we have another instance of the splendid impartiality of scripture. The ancestor of Israel's hereditary enemy, the Edomites, is presented here as chivalrous and dignified and full of mag and magnanimity and generosity. So it's both ways. And, and really, when they're approaching each other, I think each of them, you could follow in your comments, I think each of them is coming in acting. They're both fearful of what might happen and are putting on an act to try and see how the other one feels. And maybe Esau was going to attack, but when he saw how um, Jacob came bowing down seven times, he said, oh, well, he's not going to attack me. So then he and kind might have said, okay, well, I'll go kiss him. But right, either so one is, is really doing what they feel. Right. And if we look back to the first, to the opening of the chapter, and that's why I asked what was, what were the salient points in the opening verse? Esau is coming with 400 men. Right? Esau is not coming with his family. He's not coming with his children. He's coming with 400 men. And Jacob is duly afraid. Right. He's facing an army. I read, um, it yes. seems to me that this is one of those other things where you have to read the rest of the story to get the meaning of this part, because they turn Esau into a bad man. So how can he give a sincere, you know, is, does he flip flop every time? So this sort of sets up the idea that it was insincere and the rest of the story, which I'm not terribly familiar with, follows along. Right, so as I said the, uh, earlier, the, the interpretation of the kiss is to a large degree determined by the rest of the chapter. So let's come back to it, right? Um, so Vayisa et Enav, now we're talking about Esav. He, he looked up, he saw the women and the children. Um, he asked, um, who are these? I don't know who he would have thought they are, but uh, he asks, who are these? So it's a rhetorical question, let's say. Um, and Yaakov answers, these are the children whom God has favored your servant. Um, and then the, the maids with their children came forward and bowed. And then Leah came with her children and bowed. And then Joseph and Rachel came with her and they bowed. Um, and he asked, what do you mean by all this company which I have met? And he answered, to gain my Lord's favor. Okay, so here the text in my view gets a little bit um, inexact as to who's speaking to who. Um, uh, what do you mean by this this whole camp? Asher Pagashti that you that which I have met. Vayomer, and he said, Adonai, Adonai, to 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 gather um, uh, favor, but from my Lord, right? 
and he says, um, um, I have enough, my, my brother, let what you have remain yours. Right? So what's, what, 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 how are they, what's going on? I mean, it's it's a it's a rather um, less than clear. It seems to me less than clear text. Um, or to put it another way, there are social customs here that are invoked without being actually mentioned. Right. So Jacob's whole approach to Esau is meant to gain his the Lord, Esau's favor. How is how how do those two come together? And what is it? What favor is Jacob hoping to gain by exhibiting all of his wives and children, etc.? I'm going to stop share because I can't see everybody's face otherwise. Right. Terry. A, a peaceful transport, I think, would be what Jacob is hoping for, to have this meeting come through without warfare and continue. But if I, mean, he, he, I, I can't believe that he's offering to give Esau his handmaidens and her children as a gift. I mean, that would be unforgivable. So he's, I mean, ultimately right, so he's going to give him some goods, but... Uh, okay, so let's let's assume he's not giving them the kids. Yeah, no. So, uh, he's, he, he, but he, what is he trying to show him? By he's he's trying to show he's 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 trying to show them that he has enough. He has personal wealth, and that he's he's in good shape. Right, Esther. But, but that still um, doesn't really acknowledge the tension of the scene because you had someone who stole the blessing and the inheritance and so that by coming back to Canaan, Jacob is coming back to take, take possession of, of his inheritance. And so that this scene is fraught with underlying tension. And, and if you see it, it's so theatrical that you yeah. have the group. Remind, re reminds me of the king and I. Right. And, and so that, but there is an enormous, and we can't forget, underlying tension with reference to inheritance and possession of Okay, the good. <laughs> Excuse me. Good. So in, in the context of that tension now, what is Jacob really saying? Or what he might, what might he be saying? I think let's forget about things in the past and let's make up. Okay, so one possibility is don't worry about the, the blessing. I've succeeded. I don't need anything else, right? I'm perfectly happy with what I have. You don't have anything to fear from me. I'm not going to take what's yours, right? At the same time, um, broadcasting, if you will, that in fact, the blessing has worked out. He has succeeded, right? He has gotten what he, uh, as much as he has gotten. Esther? This is actually a competition between them. Although the years have passed, if you have two children, perhaps two similar siblings, two males, two, there's always that underlying sense of competition. and. No matter what they say to us, to each other, no matter how they kiss the necks, and after the necks, there was a little phrase I wanted to add, and they had tears, which even made it more schmaltzy. Um, there is this this who has bettered the other, and that's that's the basic message. Okay, I think you're right. There is this competitive uh, aspect, <clears throat> but. What I think is important here about the competitive aspect is that they both have succeeded, right? So they're both trying to say that on the basis of my success, 
<clears throat> you have nothing to fear from me. Susan, you had a your hand up. Unmute. Unmute. Susan, you have to. Uh, in that initial meeting where they hugged, kissed. Raise your hand in the air. I think that what we're seeing is an emotional up and down. And I mean, I've seen people who I don't even like that much, haven't seen them for a long time, and maybe it's just me, but it's just a connection. And you do have, if not tears, you do emotionally connect. And I think that's all part of what's going on here. Um, okay. They draw back, but, but I, I, I see that as just brothers doing that. At the very least, it is emotionally complex. Okay, yes. It, it, it's as emotionally complex as anything really we've seen in the Torah up until this moment. Yeah. Uh, and part of the complexity I'm gonna suggest <laughs> is to keep in mind that we're not reading history. Okay, sure. <laughs> right? So somebody is putting this story together and this relationship is a central focus of the historical narrative, right? So again, just keep that in mind, we'll come back to it. Jean, you were next and then Robin. Yes, there also may be a symbolic interpretation here. One can give the forces of uh, war and power, Esau shows up with his 400 men. And if you imagine the picture, Jacob is coming with children and women. Mm -hmm. The forces of peace, of family, of uh, the grace that God has given, blessed him with these children. And if you were to imagine the picture, each one of them, Leah and the children, the handmaids and the children, they take turns coming and bowing before this army of 400 men. So, so it could be family, um, fertility, peace, versus the uh, force and power and might. Me. So I think that I think that that's definitely part of the complexity, right? If we go back to the beginning of the story, uh, Jacob is an Ishtam and Esau is a man of the field, right? They have both lived up to their uh, projected uh, character, right? Uh, and, and so the, 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 there are levels Right, there are le various levels at which the story operates. And certainly one of the, those levels is in fact, um, the, um, I don't know what the right word is, the choice or the confrontation between um, the life of, the, of, of, of settled civilization, mm -hmm. right? Farm life, agricultural life, society, versus sort of the warlike tribal, um, um, prim more, somewhat more primitive state of, um, of, uh, uh, of uh, society, right? And the, the peace-loving, civilized society um, segment of this relationship is going to win out. Right? We know that Jacob is going to succeed. Uh, he's going to be, and, and, and Jacob will give birth to the people of Israel with no contribution from Esau. Right? Esau is out of the picture. So the society, which ultimately Israel will claim for itself, is a, is a civilized um, law-abiding society. 
I think that that's also part of this complexity. Robin, you were next and then back to Susan. I think what first point or follow up point to what Jean said, this is sort of parallel to the kiss, the kiss in the, in the past, the, the, the present kiss and the uh, sort of prophecy or uh, projection of what each of them would be. And again, the sort of the nomad or the wanderer and the man of war and the more domestic, domesticated uh, brother. I wanted to bring in another comment. This is from the Art Scroll Humash, and this is about the going back a little, if you don't mind, about the kiss uh, and kissed him. Uh, so first of all, starting with Esau embraced him, it says, Esau's compassion was aroused by Jacob's seven prostrations, and that's Rashi, and then, and kissed him. In the Torah scroll, there are dots over each letter of this word, an exegetical device that calls attention, we've already talked about this, to hidden allusions. The sages disagree regarding the significance of the dots in this verse. Some hold that Esau's kisses were insincere, but Rev uh, Shimon Bar, uh, Bar Yochai says that although it is an immutable rule that Esau hates Jacob, but that was an interesting statement, at that moment his mercy was aroused and he kissed Jacob with all his heart. Okay. And, then, well, and then they wept. Following the above view that Esau was genuinely moved by the sight of Jacob, uh, Reb Hirsch comments that one cannot cry unless he is genuinely moved where tears flow from the innermost feelings. Esau's kiss accompanied by tears proved that he was more than a selfish, violent hunter. He too was a descendant of Abraham who was capable of setting aside his sword in favor of human Just, you know, another corner heard from. <laughs> so it's interesting, of course, always interesting to note how um, that even uh, ideas that seem to be fully settled in the tradition are always uh, up for conversation and different opinions and different ways of looking at things. Keep in mind that the commentaries that you're reading and that Art Scroll is highlighting are medieval commentaries, far, far removed from having to in any way um, wrestle with, uh, with Esau as a real um, as, sim as symbolizing a real um, uh, enemy, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I, okay, so Susan was next, then Sheldon. Um, Elliot, I think, had something to say. Plus, because we're going to run out of time, I really want to get to the end of the chapter. Right? Okay. okay. I just Susan. want to say is when, when you mentioned about, quote, the decision that the authors wrote in um, deciding that it was a, a civilized society, uh, or I, those are not your exact words. I thought of a, that this was a corrective to the Cain and Abel story. And again, the two brothers and the discussion of family, um, you can decide how your society is without killing the other. And right, so I think it's a it's a good ref it's a good reference, uh, but it's even bigger than that. Okay, right? <clears throat> in that every story, right from Cain and Abel on, every story that we have encountered in Genesis uh, deals with sibling rivalry. Oh wow! Right. Cain and Abel, um, Yitzhak and, um, and Ishmael, Yaakov and Esau, and Joseph and his brothers, finally. Right, so, with the exception of the slightly anomalous story of Abraham, <clears throat> who actually doesn't have a brother, and in that sense really stands out as a kind of an anomaly, right? <clears throat> and that that the only person <laughs> in the in the whole book that is able to maintain a, a kind of level of pure righteousness is the one person that doesn't have a sibling. Right? <laughs> um, otherwise, everybody else is in as uh, as 
as someone pointed out earlier, so everyone is in competition with their sibling on some level. <clears throat> and, and, you know, exactly what that means it could take us weeks to, to kind of tease out. I mean, what, what do we make of that? What, if that's one of the main themes of this entire book, how do we, how do we understand that? And where does it come from? And what is it telling us? So those are big themes that, that hopefully we will have an opportunity to, to give some thought to as we come towards the end of the book. Okay. Uh, Shelley, you're next. Yeah. So Robert Alter in his comments says that there's a scribal error here and the vov <laughs> at the end of the word really belongs in the next word and that uh, Asa alone is weeping and that Jacob remains impassive. Okay. So that's one of the, <laughs> it's one of the things about critical studies of the Torah that is uh, it's always somewhat problematic, right? So we can, we can I, I, would, I would never argue with Robert Alter's scholarship. Right? So if Robert Alter says that there's a scribal error, I believe him. But it doesn't matter, right? Because the scribal error is, is, makes the Torah as we know it. And we can only really deal with the Torah traditionally as we know it, right? And to just take the problem out of existence by ascribing it to a scribal era kind of ruins all the fun. Right? Um, so, uh, so at least for now, we're going to ignore Robert Alter. Um, okay. Um, let's see if we can do a quick reading and get to see where this all story ends and then we have more time for conversation. So, um, um, so in any case, it appears that Isa understands Jacob's gesture as a way in which Jacob is communicating that he is prepared to share his bounty with Isa. And Isa says, I have enough, my brother. Let what you have remain yours. And Jacob says, no, I pray you, if you would do me this favor, accept from me this gift. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Obviously a very important phrase that we can come back to, right? Please accept my present, which has been brought to you, for God has favored me, and I have plenty. And he urged him, and he accepted. So Jacob has sent um, gifts to Esau, right? We know that before this meeting, right? If we go back to me, when Jacob is still across the other side of the river, before he wrestles with the angel, he sends gifts to Esau, right? So Esau has had gifts, and then the family has made themselves known. Um, and now Jacob, so Esau says, I don't need your gifts. Jacob says, please take them, right? Um, now gifts are, are not, are, you know, they're not um, neutral. Gifts carry obligations. Mm. Right? Accepting a gift is kind of like making a covenant, right? It's a peace offering. Um, and Esau initially rejects the peace offering, which is an interesting comment on the nature of that kiss, right? But Jacob pushes him and, um, and Apparently, this verse that says, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God and you have received me favorably, somehow influences Esau to accept the gift and the covenant is made. Um, and then Esau says, okay, let's go on together. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll go back home, we'll, we'll walk together, right? Let us start on our journey and I will proceed at your pace. But Jacob says, nah, you know, no, really, I, I'm, I got these kids with me. I can't travel as fast as you can with your army. So you go, 
and I'll I'll come later. And then Jacob says, uh, Esau says, okay, well, let me leave some guards with you to help you. Mm -hmm. right? Let me leave my cavalry. Um, and Jacob says, oh, no, 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 I, I, you're too kind. I don't need anybody, right? And although we don't get a really fleshed out conversation at that point, Esau gives up, right? He is convinced potentially that Jacob is not a threat. And so Esau goes back to Seir and Jacob probably sighing a great sigh of relief goes the other way, right? He journeys to Sukkot and he builds a house and he made stalls for his cattle. He settles in and that's why the place is called Sukkot, right? Um, he made huts for his cattle, so he called the place Huts, Hutsville. <laughs> um, and, um, and then the story um, uh, shifts uh, and Jacob arrives safely in the city of Shechem. Um, so his, his sojourn at Sukkot is short-lived, which is interesting, right? Sukkot are temporary dwellings, mm. right? And they're the, the same idea will be used by Israelites in the wilderness who will live in Sukkot. And of course, will make the make itself known to us in the festival of Sukkot, which commemorates the dwelling in the wilderness, but could also commemorate Jacob's dwelling in the city of Sukkotville or Hutville, right? Um, or to put it more specifically, Jacob's sojourn in Sukkot is a presages or is a kind of, um, you know, uh, what's the word for that, right? Uh, he he uh, is a model, right? Hmm. For the, the later dwelling in the, in the wilderness, right? Foreshadows. Foreshadows, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, and then finally, um, he goes to Shlem um, and he encamps before the city and the parcel of land where he pitched his tent he purchased from the children of Hamor, Shem's father for a hundred for a hundred kisitas, whatever that is and he builds an altar and calls it El Elohe Yisrael El the God of Israel okay so that ends chapter 33. <clears throat> chapter 34 will start an entirely new saga, uh, which is, um, focuses around the story of Dina, which we will um, get into next week. But now we have the whole chapter. And based on the whole chapter, how can we read um, the, the evolution, as it were, of this story? Right? When Jacob and Esau meet and kiss, if we keep in mind the entirety of what's going to unfold in this story, um, how would we um, how would we understand the Masoretic dots over the word and he kissed and they kissed? So now you've got the whole story, and the question is, uh, how do we? Uh, what what underlies this? What emerges as the central <clears throat> tension, the central idea of this of this encounter, Esther? Well, what what strikes me, this is I don't know. Think this is the central, is that after this kissing and embracing and tears together, they basically go their separate ways. Uh, 
Jacob refuses to take any of the men with him and goes on to set up his own land and his own uh, family. And we don't hear of Esau. It says Esau goes back back to Shear, I think it was. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. sort of a, a strange parting that is in some ways unrelated to this idea of their finally coming together and, and kissing. Right, good. Okay, Terry? But I think one of the points is they get to go their own way, but they get to go their own way in peace. There is no conflict there when the two of them meet that certain, I think both of them expected from the way they acted, uh, Esau by bringing his army with him. And presumably he had a big family too, that you know, he's not the family man. He doesn't show the family, he shows his army. And, but, but the kiss is maybe, listen, we don't want to fight. I don't like you, you don't like me. Let's go our own ways and leave it like that. Do we ever hear of Esau again? Yes. Doesn't he Where's... show up for the death of... Yeah. yeah. It's fine. Right. So the next time they get together is at um, uh, Isaac's funeral, right? Yeah. Right. Um, which is not unlike a lot of estranged siblings, right? Ishmael comes in and for Isaac for Abraham's funeral. Right. Right. So it's a that we see the same pattern in terms of Esau. But functionally the story of Esau and Yaakov is finished here. Right. We don't have any more drama between the two. So on a certain level, if nothing else, this is the, the, the way in which the narrator, the narrators, authors uh, bring the conclusion to the story of Jacob and Esau. Right? And they leave us asking what to make of the story as a whole. Right? And there are some really interesting parallels, as you pointed out, between the beginning of the story and the end of the story. So it's a very... Um, 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 well-written, well-constructed, beginning and an end, right? It starts with a deception. The deception is in some ways symbolized by the kiss. It ends, in my view, with a deception, also symbolized with a kiss, right? The, the tension between Esau and Yaakov is never resolved. The Torah does not feel the need to resolve the tension, but rather to live with it. Mm. Right? Which I think is an, in, you know, an interesting um, <clears throat> departure from the way in which most literature to this day, or at least until the modern period, usually came to a conclusion where things were resolved. But here we have a literature in which the tension is the whole point. The inability to resolve the tension. And as someone was, as I think as Esther was saying, but you know, just to live with it. This is the way it is. You go your way, I go mine. Um, but there's a sense that, um, that the tension is infinite or, or endless. It can't be simply resolved. Jean? Have to unmute. I think you know, they're, yes. you know they're going to be muting the candidates for the debate on Thursday. I, <laughs> I, I think it's going to be really fun to hear them saying, Mr. President, you have to unmute. Right. Uh, I think that KISS is also very complicated. It, in a certain sense, it is a kiss of peace. It's an agreement to disagree. There's a certain finality in that, even though there is no resolution of the tension. 
So the kiss could be a kiss of deception, but at the same time, there are kisses, if you will, of peace. Should be fun. And of conclusion. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. Show it. Okay, so they reconciled at first uh, for their disagreements, and uh, Esau offers to come along on the journey with uh, him, but he sort of goes his own way and separates, and they disengage from, from any future. Uh, so I think that Esau was more magnanimous in this uh, view than, <laughs> than him. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, <clears throat> maybe one of the things we'll do <clears throat> before we go on to the next story <clears throat> as a way of finishing this story up next week is to kind of take a long view of everything we know about Isa and Yaakov from the moment they were born and try to see whether or not, you know, what the, what, what the overarching theme of this story is. Um, because clearly it is a central story in the development of the Torah narrative. Um, and there are, you know, there, there has to be some kind of rationale, right? Um, and one of the questions that I started with today was, you know, is Esau really the, the villain that later authorities try to make him out to be? Fran? What strikes me through all of this is that Jacob is the deceiver, the bad guy, it seems to me, through the whole story. Esau is kind of a unaware victim, and yet Jacob is our ancestor. And what does that mean? The wily okay, so Jew? That, so that's you know? a great place. That's a great place to start next week. That's exactly what I'm suggesting. Okay. So we'll start with uh, trying to figure out um, whether we should be ashamed of our ancestry or whether we should uh, uh, embrace it, right? Okay. Uh, so that'll be it. Have a good week, everybody. It's Thank you very you much. All. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank yes, you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Very good, Francis. You and you. Look forward to seeing you all next week. Yeah. I should be back on the Genesis train. <laughs> <laughs>